Good afternoon. Today we are talking with Professor Edward Moser, a Nobel Prize winner in physiology and medicine for discovering grid cells and identifying the brain's navigation system, and uh, Professor Konstantin Anohin, director of the Institute for Advanced Studies of the Brain, Lomonosov Moscow State University, who introduced the concept of cognitum, metaphorically compared to the Library of Bubble, which is the name of the famous novel written by Borges. Neuroscience is my background too, and I am so excited today that we have such a great panelists. So let's discuss how uh, the discovery of brain navigation is connected with memory and other cognitive functions. Why we do not uh, we do not get lost? How special navigation help us? and uh, how is cognitive mapping and how, help us to understand general principles of neural network computation in the human brain. And the first question, what is the evolution of neural GPS from an animal to humans? Is spatial navigation innate or developing through a lifetime both humans and animals? And it seems that animals' ability to navigate is superior compared to human. Is it right? So, Edward, would you please start? Yes, uh, you are right that um, uh, navigation is an ability that was uh, evolved very early during evolution. So rats are good at it, mice are good at it, but actually even if you go even further down in evolution, every animal has to know how to go to places to find food, to find a mate, and so on. Otherwise, they will not survive. So this ability was developed very, very early on. And we believe that in mammals, uh, the way this is sold by the brain is quite similar, so that we can learn quite a lot from studying mouse brains, for example, about the human navigation system. Okay, and Konstantin, could you comment as well? Well, <clears throat> I can add that, for example, many invertebrate species uh, are uh, excellent at navigation. There are wonderful studies of navigation in desert ants, for example, and we know that uh, birds have excellent navigation. Pigeons are studied for their navigation abilities. There are many questions which are not solved, and I think that the further progress of neuroscience for the ability to look into the brain uh, of these different uh, animals uh, uh, doesn't matter how small they are looking in the uh, brain of the fly or the bird will tell us much more about how the evolution shaped uh, the fitting into the space uh, for the purpose of navigation with the different organization of the nervous system. Okay, but um, how do you think it's uh, actually innate, uh, I mean, uh, neural GPS, or is it really acquired uh, during the lifespan? Can we answer this now, or we need some additional uh, investigation in this area? I think we have some clues, because um, if you compare the navigation ability or, or the way this navigation system is wired up in young animals and in uh, old uh, adult animals, this uh, ability seems to be present very, very early on. So we have recorded activity from um, from uh, rats and mice when they're very young. So that means just at the point when uh, these animals leave the nest where they are together with their mother and they start to explore around for the very first time in their life. But already then they have these specialized cells that are active only at certain places in the environment um, that's so similar to a brain GPS, right? So. Uh, the fact that this is present so early suggests at least that um, this doesn't require a lot of experience. There's no, not really a lot of learning. This is present early on. So we don't know which genes are important for this, but we know that uh, it is present so early that I, I think uh, there must be a strong genetic component. 
Mm -hmm. And Constantine, could you add here, because uh, genetic uh, in, in neuroscience is actually your topic. Well, we've been studying the development of uh, hypocampal more system. Edward uh, has spent many years in studying the ontogeny of the navigation and entorhinal cortex grid cells. It's interesting that uh, there are different uh, parts of the navigation system, and uh, they are uh, involved in a different uh, waves of maturation, and some of them are more uh, prepared by evolution and developmentally constrained, while others start, like hippocampus, to be involved uh, from the early on functioning in navigation in experience-dependent manner. Mm -hmm. So there's an interesting uh, experiment. <clears throat> that uh, a student in our lab did one day because she um, she trained she raised rats in um, a very constrained environment so these rats they lived for their whole life just in a circular environment in a sphere uh, mm -hmm. and then only when they were two or three months old they were let out from this big uh, one meter sphere and then explore a normal environment and what we thought was that by affecting the early environment in such a radical way then we would somehow mess up the um, navigation system and there was small effects but by and large they recovered very very fast so uh, i think it is a very robust system that can withstand a lot of changes but then I also think it's important, as Konstantin says, that navigation is not just one brain system. There are many, many parts of the brain that have different roles uh, in different aspects of navigation, and then they work all together. But this um, GPS-like system that we worked on is uh, the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. That is um, quite well developed at a very early stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. And uh, let's uh, talk a, a little bit about the um, just uh, connection of navigation system with other cognitive uh, functions. We know that uh, topographical disorientation and memory impairment are the first signs uh, of uh, Alzheimer uh, disease and uh, how brain uh, positioning system is connected to memory and how it is involved in the development of uh, Alzheimer's uh, cognitive deficit. What do you think about it, Edward? Yeah, um, it is, uh, um, it involves to a large extent the same brain systems. So there are um, the two brain regions uh, that we work on, uh, which are strongly interconnected. That's the hippocampus and is the entorhinal cortex. So if you have a damage to, um, to these uh, brain areas, then uh, there are two things uh, that are lost, uh, particularly. It is the ability to find your way, and it is uh, daily life memories, what, often what we call episodic memories. Um, and it's the same as you mentioned in Alzheimer's disease. Two things again, people uh, tend to get lost and they can't remember. So, um, and that's also what we find when we study uh, brain cells from, uh, uh, from uh, animals. When uh, we record the activity from cells, we find that they, uh, they respond to the location in the environment, but they also have memory properties. So that what I think happens here is that um, space or location is an important part of these daily life memories. So if we think of any memory of what you did earlier today, maybe when you had breakfast or walked to the work, then there's always a space component because it's, space is a part of those memories. And I think that's reflected in the fact that it's the same system that, uh, uh, that works on both, um, both uh, space and memory. There's different components of it, but they're very, very strongly interlinked. And Constantine, could you probably also comment on this? I can just uh, extend uh, what Edward said uh, in a different way, that when you ask the question about 
the involvement of brain navigation system or GPS system into other domains of higher cognitive functions. It is a kind of an assumption that there is such a system like a box uh, located in the brain and it does this uh, job but somehow it might be also uh, contributing to other things. In reality what we have is that the same nerve cells in uh, different brain areas contributing to this system in hippocampus in anterior cortex. They are involved in uh, uh, global activity of the organism, goal-directed activity in many, many tasks with many aspects. For example, Edward has been showing in his earlier work that the play cells uh, are concentrated uh, uh, around the goals where the rat is navigating in the water maze to find the, the platform. Other people have been doing uh, so. The same cells will be involved in hippocampus, not only in place, but uh, in the way this place is related to the route to obtain the goal, or to uh, the time domains, or to operant tasks, uh, what the animal, the rat is doing, or even to orders and many other things. So if you damage, this uh, uh, huge neural circuitry. You damage these cells with all these cognitive functions. Okay. And, 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 and also the other aspect of it is that the aspects of uh, navigation system <clears throat> are present to in, in less concentrated manner, but still in many other brain areas. They are present in the retrosplenial cortex, parietal cortex. There was a recent report that even in the somatosensory cortex, they are present uh, in anterior claustrum. Uh, so it, it is a diffuse system. Uh, the, the brain works uh, uh, in uh, a global fashion. Uh, different brain regions have their uh, uh, specialization, but it is all uh, interwoven uh, very much. <clears throat> so the cognitive disturbances which we have with us emergencies, they reflect this all. Mm -hmm. And can animals also develop the Alzheimer's disease or it's just a model which cannot be used here? It's only for just a human disorder. So Alzheimer's disease is uh, a human disease, but it is possible to study it in animals still because there are mouse and, and rat models where uh, similar genes have been manipulated. So, uh, or you can introduce even human genes into the genome so that you can get Alzheimer-like symptoms in mm -hmm. mouse brains, for example, and then see that the brain starts degenerating early in life and uh, also that um, it spreads in the same way and uh, also that uh, this causes deficits in uh, memory and also in, uh, in navigation. So um, you can reproduce it very much, although this is, um, um, as I understand it, very much a human disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, it's very difficult to meet uh, Alzheimer mouse or a rat in the street. <laughs> uh, people are making a lot of effort to reproduce it in the animal model. Yes. Okay. Well, um, recent advances in artificial intelligence and neuroscience are really impressive. And in uh, AI, uh, this includes the development of uh, computer programs that can even outperform Grandmaster at Go. Uh, a great deal of this progress uh, seems to be related to discovery in the field of spatial navigation. Uh, the mechanism and brain regions involved in neural uh, computation of cognitive maps. Um, and how AI can uh, advance neuroscience and vice versa, how neuroscience can advance uh, AI. Are brains smarter than computer? <laughs> what actually we can expect here? 
<laughs> I think that brains, brains and computers are, they have some similarities, but they're also important to remember they are quite different. So, uh, um, the, I mean, brains work with neurons, which are quite slow, right? And, uh, and, uh, um, but then there are similarities. So, uh, I mean, uh, for example, neurons, um, brain cells operate in, uh, in, um, in, um, in a binary manner, so either they fire or are active or they don't fire, so you can find many similarities. But then when it comes to the performance, then there is, um, uh, I don't think you can say one is better than the other. Computers have all the way since the beginning been much better at doing things fast, searching for information, calculating and so on, much, much faster than uh, the human brain could ever do. And this is just, uh, a um, uh, major difference, but um, when it comes to um, um, handling more noisy information and maybe information that comes through many channels at the same time, then until recently it was difficult even for a computer just to tell if an object was a chair or a table. <laughs> so, I mean, that that is of course solved now, but uh, because there are different light settings so that um, if you don't have the experience of a human being who has seen maybe thousands of chairs that used not to be so easy. Now with artificial intelligence, you can train computers to, to do that. So that's uh, no longer a problem. But nonetheless, I think a major difference is that human beings have lived lives of many decades and have so much accumulated information that they can use flexibly in not instructed ways that I still think that um, um, it, it is not quite easy to compare, and there are some human functions that you cannot easily replicate in a computer, which most is relate, more is related to creativity and spontaneous behavior uh, and so on, which often underlies human behavior. But I think it would be interesting to hear what Konstantin says about that too, because there are different views in this field about it. Mm -hmm. I have to say that I agree completely with that, but I just can uh, add something. But uh, in the same vein, uh, I think that uh, number one, those who study uh, the brain uh, as a biological organ, they face, I think, the understanding of how far uh, the modern artificial intelligence, despite the terms uh, borrowed, uh, from neuroscience and uh, a few principles borrowed from neuroscience, how, how far uh, they are from the real brain. I, we experience difficulty even in explaining uh, the tremendous amount and depth of this difference. So in terms of uh, convergence of these two fields, there is a lot and probably many decades uh, to be done. This is number one. Number two, there are surprising things which are similar, uh, especially because of the uh, uh, what I said in number one. Uh, uh, for example, if you will train the deep uh, neural network uh, to certain uh, things by reinforcing uh, the correct uh, discriminations. Uh, the neurons in the deep layers of uh, this network will start to recognize many things and categorize them in a very similar uh, manner to how the neurons in the animal brain do this. And they will do it even uh, for the things which are not uh, being trained for, not being uh, reinforced. For example, if you start training the deep network for recognizing Edward face, you will find uh, some, uh, at some point that there are deep uh, layers and neurons which recognize uh, the books on the bookshelves uh, of the image of uh, uh, Edward office, though uh, the network has not been trained uh, for this particular feature. Why uh, 
taking into account this huge difference in the organization of the deep networks in the uh, biological brain and artificial intelligence, there are some common features of striking similarity. It's a very interesting and important question. And in terms of the techniques you asked about the contribution of artificial intelligence, there are exciting developments of how you can use uh, deep learning to find out uh, what really neurons being recorded from the brain are uh, having as their receptive fields, what they see. Uh, by maximizing with the special type of uh, generative uh, uh, neural networks, the response of these neurons and looking for the what excites them most of all. It is called inception loops, extreme uh, deep networks, which uh, are collecting the most exciting inputs to these neurons. Uh, it is very difficult to do this. People have done it by presenting hundreds of pictures to monkeys, for example. But artificial intelligence allows us now to see much more. Do you think it will be overwhelmed uh, just in uh, probably in the 10 years? So can really artificial intelligence uh, just overwhelm this uh, babies and uh, became as smart as uh, let's say biological brain uh, in this uh, would say aspect, or you you believe it's not possible. <laughs> so we. I, 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 I never wanted to predict about the future, but I still think that there are major differences that cannot be easily compensated for, such as the fact that we as humans uh, have been storing information every little second for, in my case, 59 years of life history, so that uh, there is a lot of information in that brain that can be combined in, in, in uh, new ways all the time. And, uh, and I think uh, for a, a computer to do that without instructions, that is quite hard. But on the other hand, I, I do think that um, artificial intelligence will be, and already is, but will be more and more important as a tool in science because we have such huge amounts of data that we are now collecting from the brain or from any other uh, uh, structure in, in any science really, that uh, with artificial intelligence, you can identify patterns and links uh, that you can't really see or imagine even by uh, the human brain. So I think as a research tool, it just becomes more and more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I join Edward in this answer. So you agree? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, actually, we have an interesting question uh, from our audience. Uh, may I ask you one at least? Uh, so, Renata asking, uh, could Neira GPS allow us to get closer to understanding the brain can speed up perception and cause the time dilation effect that occurs in extreme situations? After all, this effect is associated uh, uh, and with action and space, and it means that neuro-GPS can be associated with areas of the brain that are also responsible for the perception of time. What do you think about it? It's really a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, um, certainly space should not be seen in, in isolation. So first I would say that I think uh, by understanding the space system, we can learn a lot about uh, the principles of how the, the entire brain works, because it is quite easy to study, it's easy to measure in uh, mice, for example, because you can, you can measure the location and you can compare it with the brain activity, and you can make simple tests where you, na where you navigate in, for example, in mazes and find, uh, goal, find foods and rewards and so on. So it has been a gateway into the higher level parts of the brain and probably is informing us about general principles about the entire brain. Uh, but the second thing I then want to say, there was this link, um, suggested link to time. So space and time are two fundamental aspects that actually are quite related. And again, the hippocampus, like many, many other brain areas, is also expressing the passage of time. So you can actually read the passage of time out of both the hippocampus and a certain area 
of the uh, entorhinal cortex. So if you record activity and feed that into a computer, you can actually tell how far on the timeline the recording was. So somehow space and time are put together and both are elements of uh, our memories. Our daily life memories contain space, but they also can time, contain the time component. And this is mixed together into memories. So um, I think this all comes together as, as also Konstantin mentioned. It is part of a bigger picture, but sometimes in science you have to break it down and study things in isolation in order to later understand the whole thing. Okay, Konstantin, <laughs> would you comment on this? Or I can also add that, though not probably speaking again about GPS system, but uh, the brain uh, systems networks involved in this function, uh, they're closely related to the um, issue of how fast we can process the information, the brain can process information, and the modes of oscillations in which this processing can become uh, faster, uh, like in the situations of uh, danger where the person is experiencing this. And one of these modes are so-called ripples, where these are high-frequency oscillations. And uh, during these ripples, uh, brain can extract from memory and replay uh, the uh, events and sequences much faster than in the actual behavioral sequences in real life. And the ripples and uh, the rhythms uh, of the brain uh, which controls this activity are closely linked to hypocampal system, which is uh, navigation. Uh, so time and space here are uh, within the same domain. Okay, but some people uh, just react the opposite on uh, extreme situation and their probably cognitive function uh, just getting slower, so they are like frozen. So uh, could we conclude that emotions to some extent just uh, stop or blockage our, uh, I would say, skills in navigation uh, of space? So anyhow, they influence these capabilities of humans. Yeah, emotions uh, are also there. Are, uh, there's a network. Many places of the brain are quite uh, strongly activated during emotions, and also these systems connect to uh, the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. So they work together. And of course, during extreme emotions, you may just block out memories, or uh, you may actually opposite. You may remember things very well because uh, there is emotional activation, and you will have this memory stuck into your brain for the mm -hmm. rest of your life. So it can go both ways. But uh, it just illustrates that uh, emotions do modulate both the memory formation and memory recall or retrieval. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Probably we can say also that uh, it's not the matter of fact that in the situation of danger, uh, internal clock in some brains start to uh, work faster and in others, like in the emotional freezing, they mm -hmm. slow down. It's more, I think, of different types of uh, processes because with the emotions, it's not slowing down of the activity of the brain. It is more of the complex situations which are not resolved and decisions are not made. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So, and uh, how we, maybe we can train somehow our capabilities uh, just uh, taken into consideration what you have said. So if we will just anyhow just uh, control our emotions, probably then uh, they will not influence negatively our capabilities of navigation. Is it true or? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it follows from the fact that emotions uh, modulate our memories, for example, that, uh, and we all know that if you want to learn something, if you want to study something, it helps to be motivated, be excited, and really like it. If you think it's totally boring, you will probably not remember so much of it. We all know that. So I, I think it just illustrates the, uh, the concept that uh, emotions actually matter for also for learning and remembering. 
I can also probably add in a slightly different uh, aspect uh, of the role of the so-called GPS system, uh, the navigation system, hypercampus and rhinal cortex. Uh, with the situation of lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, it is not the effect of uh, virus, COVID itself, but it is whether the lockdown can influence our cognitive abilities. And there is not much studied in, the, uh, in this domain, but there, there have been two studies, one in Italy and one in Scotland, uh, uh, where uh, scientists look specifically on the effects of lockdown, but not uh, in the healthy ind individuals. And in the Italian study, they showed that uh, people with the lockdown report problems, and these problems are in attention time, uh, organization and perception, uh, organization of uh, actions. Uh, in Scotland, they uh, showed that there are different cognitive abilities. Uh, when the lockdown is released, they come uh, back, but Still, the scientists who do this, there are several groups in Cambridge, in King's College, in uh, London study this. They, uh, interestingly, though they are not neurobiologists, but cognitive scientists, recommend people, for example, when they're in a lockdown, to move more from one room to another or to change the arrangement of the room where they stay in lockdown from time to time. It, it looks that empirically they are somehow addressing the uh, issue of uh, stimulating plasticity of this uh, hypocampal and terrinal space navigation system. Yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. So just changing the environment, uh, at least even at lockdown. Okay. Well, unfortunately, uh, time is really passing very fast. And uh, we have a last question. Um, the world uh, of new technologies is rapidly transforming our life. Uh, and uh, to your opinion, what scientific discovery in neurobiology or new technology uh, is capable to significantly change our life in the next year, in 2022 already? Edward, <laughs> well, the, I don't think there is a single one, but I can mention that is one transformation that has taken place now the last one, two, three years is that before people like me and many others recorded activity from one, two, three cells at the same time and found out how they worked. Now you can monitor the activity of many thousands, ten thousands of cells at the same time. So we understand the brain as interactions between huge numbers of cells. And that's where you find the solutions to our advanced brain functions like uh, thinking, remembering, planning, and so on. Uh, so I, I think we can expect that this will lead us on the track to understanding high level uh, cognitive functions in terms of how neurons actually work together. Mm -hmm. So, okay. I will uh, first join uh, Edward in the same uh, expectation or wish uh, to have more uh, cells recording from, recorded from the conscious brain uh, in the actual operations of the brain. And there are different developments in this field in mesoscopic to photon imaging, which allows to record from different brain uh, areas, integrated uh, neurophotonics, which uh, gives a volumetric reg registration of many thousands of neurons. Neuropixels 2, which has been released recently, and Edward was one of the uh, particip participants in this project. Uh, different new uh, sensors for neurochemicals, voltage sensitive uh, sensors for optical imaging, etc. Et this will expand a lot uh, our um, narrow window into the brain so far. But another aspect I think that as more data are being accumulated, I think we will be facing the uh, what uh, Sidney Brenner a few years ago uh, formulated is as that we are drowning in the ocean of data being obsessed with the thirst for knowledge. So along with the accumulation of this data, which we need to understand how the whole brain works, 
Neuroscience needs uh, tools for compression uh, of this data into uh, general principles. We need both. Uh, I, I think the development is going in this direction. <laughs> we need theory. That's uh, we'll never forget the role of theory, not only data. Exactly. <laughs> And uh, just uh, following your, uh, uh, what you have said, uh, what do you think um, some therapeutic or diagnostic opportunities uh, related to GPS, neural GPS, um, who, uh, how it can be somehow just uh, extended to brain-machine interfaces, uh, for example, in disorders associated with abnormal neural uh, GPS function and memory loss, um, like uh, hypocampal neural prosthetic, uh, or something like that. So, is it probably so, the opportunity of the nearest future, or it's uh, really quite a long way? I would say this depends on the brain system. So prosthetic devices, brain machine interfaces have been around for quite a while and work quite well for some systems, which is for the motor output. So you can stimulate, you can, for example, read out from, uh, from um, you can read out from the brain parts that are important for moving an arm and so on. Then you can get a computer to move a robotic arm and so these things work. And you also have on the sensory side cochlear implants and uh, the people working on vision. But when it comes to the inner parts of the brain, like uh, those at the hippocampus and so on, which are important for memory, I think it's a long way to go. There are people who play with the idea, but I think a memory is so distributed, it's very, very difficult. So I, I wouldn't expect anything to happen the next 10 years, at least. It takes so. more. Okay, clear. And My uh, prediction is also conservative. Uh, I might be uh, intuitively wrong, but I think it's years to come to address this, both technically, because we need to uh, record uh, from these areas, and we speak about humans, it is not a surface uh, recording. Mm -hmm. And conceptually, because these are very complicated systems, you cannot mm -hmm. uh, replace that with the chip, uh, with the inputs and outputs, with, which store all the plasticity and uh, accumulated plasticity and new plasticity of this piece of the deep uh, neural network. Okay, so let's discuss it in the 10 years. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much. It was really great uh, discussion and uh, um, very interesting uh, answers, um, a lot of information just to think over well later. So uh, very happy to see you both and really uh, hope to see you again at least next year. Next year. Well, thank you very much. It was a you. pleasure. Enjoyed it. Bye bye. Bye.
транспортно-логистический холдинг «Российские железные дороги». Мы развиваем транспортную инфраструктуру страны, строим новые станции, вокзалы и создаем новые возможности для вашего бизнеса. Лучшие скоростные и высокоскоростные поезда сделают ваше путешествие комфортным и безопасным. Мы – локомотив экономики. Сотни миллионов тонн грузов ежегодно. Развитие науки и социальной сферы – это наш вклад в благосостояние страны и вашу уверенность в завтрашнем дне. Есть история фантастическая, есть история сказочная, есть страшная история, а есть история реальная. В Юка всегда реальная история и диагностика автомобилей с пробегом. Юка официальный сервис Hyundai. Смотрите историю и диагностику автомобиля. И...